the introduction, my presentation will be quite short, the maximum five, five, six minutes. So welcome everybody. I'm Lubos and I am from uh, NanoProgress cluster. I am a vice president there and uh, we have together a project at PAC that uh, it's uh, for supporting the internationalization of uh, SMEs and uh, another uh, another actor to three uh, target markets. So the good thing is that uh, any company or any uh, member of our cluster ecosystems can participate in activities and together we are covering more than 700 SMEs and innovation actors. Uh, as for the target market, I will speak about it briefly in the next slide. Uh, we have six partners in the consortium. So the great uh, guys from Germany, from Plasma Technology Cluster, uh, Plastic Cluster from Belgium, our cluster from Czech Republic focusing on our technology, then uh, IT Solutions Cluster from France, Packaging Cluster from Spain, and food, Agri-Food Cluster from Portugal. So we are focusing on three markets, uh, on the US market, China, and Canada. Uh, and uh, you can participate in many ways in the project. You can benefit from, uh, from uh, uh, we are going to organize missions to this market, so you can benefit from uh, these missions. You can go to the market and create partnerships there, and all the missions will be fully organized, and you will get also financial support for this. Uh, we will give more information how to participate and what are the requests this criteria for participation in the following month, so definitely stay tuned. And then you can also benefit from uh, market intelligence provision services uh, from partnering. You can use our network for any collaboration ideas or business ideas you have. Uh, for internationalization support, then uh, we will create a group together with ambassadors and they will provide you information uh, about the culture, about the neg negotiation, about the business, and uh, about the best ways how to proceed on, on each market. So for this we are also uh, using uh, international tool, cross-cluster innovation platform Clue5, uh, that is based in Germany. As, as you know, the German guys have really uh, trust-based environment, and uh, this tool provides many, many uh, good features. You can have their the agenda, you can have a pools, video conference, uh, uh, you can have your profile and uh, yeah, you can use it for strong partner network because this is tool for clusters and it integrates many cluster organizations. And in this tool we are, we already created core group with your profile. And then uh, you can, uh, then there will be some, uh, some discussion groups based on the topics of target market. So check this platform and definitely it's really easy to use and uh, yeah, we recommend to use it as much as possible. Uh, so in the future of the partnership, we would like to continue with our activities. So we created an established legal structure for this, uh, which is the European uh, Economic Interest Grouping at PAC. Uh, this economic grouping has an objectives to uh, also create environment and tools for incubating new project ideas, supporting the innovation and internationalization of all of you. And of course, uh, also this will be a good tool and strong argument for the European Commission uh, to be more visible. And we would like really to use this uh, newly uh, born interest grouping for straightening the relationship with the Commission and providing more added value services for you. We we are now having, a, for instance, a good service for uh, innovation support through the vouchers, and this will be also the main uh, main uh, interest grouping for for the support. And you will get also this all this information through Blue Five platform. Uh, so from uh, my quick introduction, that's all. And now I would like to give the floor to Peter. And in case you have any questions, just feel free to contact me. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Lubos, and I think Alexander will just um, upload the yes, right, the presentation of Peter. And uh, Peter, we are really happy to to have you here, and we are really looking forward for your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is Peter Kalai, and um, I've, I've been a founder of IntelliFlex for the last uh, five years, and uh, I'll, I will tell you a little bit about uh, IntelliFlex and how we are building the smart packaging cluster with our partners and uh, how we position Canada in this business. Uh, so with that, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this presentation, and um, I just wanted to mention that your cluster leaders all were in Canada and we hosted them for a great meeting, and I want to congratulate them because they bring together a very strong and very interesting cluster for European collaboration. So um, that's the general agenda, and um, I just want to tell you a little bit about who is IntelliFlex. Uh, we are the National Technology Alliance. Um, we work in printable, flexible, and hybrid electronics. It's uh, you ever go to our website, feel free to get more details on what that means, uh, what sort of technologies we are developing. Um, and uh, our current ecosystem is uh, about 125 members. Um, this includes uh, startup companies, this includes SMEs, this includes uh, uh, SME of small to medium sized enterprise in Canada. Uh, it includes uh, large Canadian companies, multinationals, and international companies that uh, wish to uh, work in North America. Those are industri industrial members. And we also have um, very strong alignment with end user communities. One of the early stage developments have been the smart packaging segment. Uh, so we started that uh, right away. And um, we believe that we have developed some interesting insights into that segment over the years. Um, I will just uh, move to the next page. Um, we um, have a member who is ICI. Uh, ICI is the Printability and Graphics Communication Institute in Montreal. And um, ICI is the official representative for ATPAC uh, for Canada. And uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, they have organized meetings in, uh, in Toronto for, for your group, uh, for all your networks, um, and we hosted them at our IntelliPAC meeting. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. So ICI is a very strong um, technology center in Montreal, and uh, over the last five years um, has developed a very strong capability not just in the printing industry that they have been evolving over a couple of decades, but also in printed electronics and, and, and smart packaging. Many of our printers have evolved um, into the smart packaging sector or in the packaging sector and looking at smart packaging. So ICI has invested a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, uh, dollars into very large scale and, and some of the smaller scale equipment. They are experts in ink formulation. We have a lot of technology capabilities that uh, our members can utilize. And of course, you can utilize if you wish to from overseas. Um, so with that, as I mentioned, they are the official representative for, uh, for APAC and the lending point for you. So, and Andre Dion, who is the general manager, is also on this call. Um, and he can be reached through your cluster coordination buddies. I'm just getting used to moving my slides. The IntelliPAC program. So this was a program that we launched um, to bring together both the end user community as well as uh, our technology firms. It's an accelerator program to help advance the smart packaging, uh, to develop knowledge, the training, and understand what are the what are the inhibitors of, uh, of the adoption uh, of smart packaging. And this is a program that is joined with the Packaging Consortium. The Packaging Consortium is a North America's leading packaging industry organization. They have um, over 450 members, and we have a very strong partnership uh, that we developed together. 
and the IntelliTech program has a leadership council. So the leadership council is made up of 20 or so industry individuals and leaders from various um, private sector organizations as well as a few not-for-profit and government labs. And they are the governing body uh, who are telling us what we should be doing for the benefit of a larger uh, uh, packaging industry and where our technologies can be rolled out and uh, where our technologies need to be introduced. So our goal has been to really understand the issues, to provide services and, and try to solve some of those issues that we, we identify for our members and of course for the greater community. Um, we have had lots of projects that were created informally and or formally uh, because we have been the focal point for smart packaging development and adoption in, um, in many ways, not just in Canada, but a little bit further uh, 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 south of the border as well. We do provide training, various levels of, tra uh, of training, and as I mentioned, uh, the goal for this program is to help companies get involved quickly and understand the marketplace, understand who the key players are, understand what the international opportunities are, very much like what you guys are doing in your own um, organized cluster. However, of course, our program is industry-led and industry-funded. We don't have uh, sufficient uh, government funding uh, directly into the IntelliFact program, but we have some R&D programs that are funded by government. So one of the things that are important is looking at um, why Canada? So when you look back, um, you know, for the last couple of years, Canada has uh, ranked in the top countries for, for uh, locating headquarters for a corporation. When you look at the overall quality of life, Canada ranked very, very highly over the years. These numbers are for 2016, and since 2016, these numbers changed very little. Uh, the most recent numbers came out actually yesterday, and um, when I look at the, those numbers, they're very consistent. Canada ranks among the top countries, and, um, and, and that's for sure uh, hasn't changed over the last, uh, last four or five years. So second for citizenship, and uh, third for business. So uh, when we look at uh, why would you want to work with Canadians or, or, or why would you want to expand towards the Canadian market, you will know that um, you know you you will be coming into an environment that is uh, you know world class. So overall, we have the second best country in, in the world, and of course, these are based on many many variables uh, that the U.S. news uh, compiles alongside with the university partners that develop this model of, of country rankings. So when you look at um, in the G7. Uh, we are we have been a very fast growing economy. Of course, um, every year this can change. Uh, with the oil prices are down this year, perhaps our economic growth is tempered. Um, definitely, we have a very strong R and D regime uh, where we, we provide local R and D support for companies, either Canadian companies or international companies that locate in Canada and do R and D. And we have among the lowest tax rates for uh, for corporations that um, that have business in Canada. So when you look at where the, the top uh, 250 Canadian technology companies are located, these are some of the major technology centers, and um, many of these centers are are <laughs> you know have also a lot of startup companies. So when you look at Toronto. Toronto has the largest tech companies and the largest concentration of large tech companies, uh, but we also do not include in this evaluation uh, the startup companies. So some of the other centers, uh, such as Kitchener, Waterloo area, which is part of the Toronto region, what we call the GTA, would rank super highly based on startup company involvement and innovation. Ottawa, where I'm speaking from, uh, which is our capital city, is um, uh, 14%. Vancouver has lots of large companies. And uh, where ICI is located, Montreal, has also a very strong innovation community. 
However, they have probably fewer larger tech companies located there um, um, at this point. But everybody is growing, um, you know, companies in Canada, and it's a very nice, um, innovative environment to enter into. As you guys might have seen, Canadian banks are, are ranked the, uh, the soundest um, in general. So we have a very stable um, economy in the sense that, you know, our banking system uh, that anchors this economy is, is very, very strong. So when you look at uh, what is the cost of operating in Canada, um, I just have one little comparison. And uh, I bring Toronto here, and I will compare the cost of operating there uh, with California. And no offense meant to, uh, to my uh, you know, fellow presenters who are going to come from the US, uh, but you know, these are some of our numbers. If you have some other arguments why to locate in the US, by all means, um, you could do that. But at least you know uh, that uh, this is what Canada has to offer. So Toronto, we have, um, when you look at an engineer, the engineering salaries are around 110,000 uh, Canadian dollars. Uh, that translates into somewhere in the neighborhood of 80,000 US. In San Francisco, that is um, almost twice as much. When you look at um, the tax credit for research and development, SRED, it's called Research and Development um, and Experimental Tax Credit, you get a 15% contribution from that. And then also we have provincial tax credit for research and development there. And so when you look at the overall uh, situation here, of course, uh, the Toronto-based uh, engineer costing you $61,000 US compared to the San Francisco-based engineer. And so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, we also have 65 federal research labs to help test and commercialize technology. So this is very, very significant. Um, and uh, they are all orientated to help private sector businesses of course, there is a user fee involved um, in, in occasion, and um, you know they don't do this for free, but they are available for with very, very high skilled uh, technologies to help organizations. So when you enter the uh, Canadian market, why would you want to enter that, right? So a couple of the opportunities for smart packaging in Canada, particularly, is that you can network with 45 uh, 450 uh, PAC members. Remember, PAC was the packaging consortium, North America's leading um, leading uh, packaging organization association. So they actually have many of the North America's and global companies as members in the packaging area, uh, retailers and brand owners. And these are all part of our, our ecosystem that you need to network to make your smart packaging uh, a reality. You can network and collaborate with leading tech developers through IntelliFlex. Certainly, we, we have international members, and we help them to network with our, our Canadian uh, partners here. And what I also want to highlight is that we have a very, very strong uh, industrial base in Canada. And uh, that's how PAC, the packaging industry organization, grew up to be a North American entity from Canada. Um, and uh, our Canadian players are very strong global players. So CTO is a label maker. And uh, they recently acquired Innovia in the UK. And uh, uh, they also own a smart, uh, smart label company in the United States that they acquired, Checkpoint. I don't know if you guys know these organizations. Cascade is a global player, again, in, um, in the uh, converting business, in the packaging business. Transcontinental has recently bought a flexible, uh, flexible packaging business in the United States, and they are evolving from a printing company into a packaging company. Very, very strong organizations. We're talking about uh, billion-dollar transactions at a time. And these are companies that are valued in tens of, of billions of dollars and listed on the stock market. So um, why is the Canadian 
uh, packaging sector so strong. Well, clearly we have had a very strong forestry industry, and then on top of that, we have had a very strong pulp and paper industry that grew into uh, a very strong packaging sector in Canada. So this has been going on for, for decades in Canada, and what, we, what you were, and us are adding to it is the smart packaging piece. I mentioned to you that we have a very low cost um, uh, compared to the U.S. in terms of resources, in terms of wages operation. And one of the reasons why these companies are so strong, and you can be very strong with us, in a sense is that the U.S. markets are accessible from Canada through the U.S. Um, MCA free trade agreement. That's the new free trade agreement that was signed recently. And um, the other part is that we have very, very high quality engineering and technical resources that are very reliable to produce quality. Um, I have been um, in a previous uh, position, uh, a global VP who was responsible for uh, some of the integrations that we've done for companies that we acquired around the world. So when I look at uh, this statement, this is clearly in the view of I have worked with people uh, you know, in, in in different parts of the world, through owning different subsidiaries, and I can tell you, we have had some very good experience with with uh, Canadian engineering and technical resources uh, from an international scale. Um, we also have very highly automated manufacturing for packaging, and also on the printed electronic side, we're working on adding that um, automation for manufacturing smart packaging components. I want to call your attention to um, um, our, our conference, which represents a, a, a big opportunity for you to come to Canada. It will be presented in Bromont, Quebec, just an hour from Montreal. And um, I don't know, how are we doing for time, uh, Katrina? Can I have a minute or, or so just to, to run a quick uh, video here? I don't know if it's going to be shared on this. Um, yeah, I think um, actually uh, Mark is already here, so he's the next speaker. So uh, yeah, I think we, we will have one more minute. Okay. So I don't know if this is going to start up, maybe not. I, I included this, and if you send out this presentation in PDF, people can cl cl uh, mm -hmm. click on this. But there's a video available on on uh, on on the web at this web address. I'm sorry, it seems like it doesn't start up through this presentation. Um, that would highlight the event. We have been um, very lucky. We have over 150 organizations that come to the CPS uh, conferences. We have um, missions that come from Europe. We have been um, uh, aligned with Applin in France, and their members come usually. Uh, we have uh, delegations from Taiwan. We have delegations from the United States, and we would welcome a delegation from APAC and APAC members. And um, if you wish, we can put on some special uh, special seminars for you. If there is sufficient um, sufficient interest, we have one day courses that we offer in flexible hybrid electronics fundamentals, or or one day course in smart packaging, which is introducing you to the smart packaging technology and the printable electronics. And of course. Uh, we will be opening a new advanced manufacturing center and scale-up program from flexible hybrid electronics within the Bromont region with our local partner called C2MI, which is a center for uh, microelectronics innovation and collaboration. Uh, we could also organize uh, a visit to ICI. I mentioned ICI is the Graphics Institute, the representative of APAC in Canada, and they also have very significant facilities for smart packaging and we could organize um, a tour through ICI before or after the conference. So I just put this out for you guys. If you ha if you have a strong in interest in in, in coming and, and collaborating, this would be a really good time for us to receive you um, as a group. Or if individuals want to join, that's fine as well. What are the barriers and what are the support measures for for trading with Canada? Um, so one of the key things here is that we, we have access to the U.S. market with a lot of global brands and, uh, and headquarters uh, that are located or co-located in Canada. Uh, we have very, very good proximity and, and, and very strong culture that we can leverage into the U.S. market and 
since we have, U.S. has been the biggest trading partner of Canada for for uh, for several decades. We have the the other part is is interesting as well. We have the CETA, which is the Canadian European Free Trade Agreement. So in fact, uh, you know, we can trade freely with you guys. And if you had a, a, a you know a capability here in Canada, then you could trade freely in the U.S. market from Canada. So we have lots of R&D programs where we have um, joint R&D opportunities. I don't know if you guys know this, but it's very, very interesting. Um, Canada is very often part of the EU programs, and um, our government is um, uh, allocating resources to collaborate with European companies um, in, in, through various programs. Uh, Canada, just as an example, is part of the Can European Space Program. Uh, we are part of the electronics program, um, and so Canadian government is allocating funding to collaborate with European companies. Um, we have very similar environmental focus as, you, as the European countries have, very, very high on the environmental protection part. Um, we have very strong capital markets that understand packaging companies, and um, we have a very strong R&D engineering and systems engineering capability. Now, some of the barriers, of course, is that we are far from, from Europe, meaning, you know, there's a little ocean to hop over. It takes uh, a couple of hours of flight, and this could increase your shipping costs, and the, our hours of operation is about six hours um, uh, difference. And um, so at some point, you probably will try to, try to have people that will see you in these markets because of these differences and, you know, probably to reduce the travel and to have a better access uh, through the free trade agreements to uh, big markets in North America. So with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about business culture. Um, Canada has a very similar and, and, and very close to the European business culture. Uh, it's likely uh, much, much closer uh, to the U.S. Uh, sorry, to the EU culture than the US culture to the EU culture. And uh, we have been a supporter of, um, you know, when, when immigrants come here, Canada supports their cultural identity. And so we're not trying to be melting them into a European, into a US culture. Uh, we try to keep our own identity. Um, we are open for business. We have clear laws, regulations, uh, very pro-business and pro-export. We know how to do that. And I mentioned to you before the strong culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. And, um, and I keep telling our, our French, uh, uh, French uh, partners that we are the only, only country in North America that actually speaks French. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting. But um, as you know, EU languages, uh, we have a lot of, a lot of uh, individuals that, can, uh, that have a second or third language. And so it's very easy to operate in your own uh, native language if you find the right people in the ecosystem. Um, all of our members in, and all of our companies, at minimum, they are North America focused, but many of them are globally focused. So you will get this uh, globally focused uh, business capability or technology capability. We never just look at what's going on in Canada. And as I mentioned, because of our history with the U.S. and as, a, as the largest trading partner, it's really, it could be a really good bridgehead, a, a jump off point to the U.S. market, uh, given our, 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 our local culture, given our, our proximity, and given our, our cultural proximity to U.S. And, and right in between the U.S. and, 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 and Europe. So um, one of the questions were asked for me was to address a few points on how to negotiate and sign a cooperation agreement. I think uh, we, the first and foremost, you need, need to know what you want and what you need, what you don't have. Um, so, you know, the important part is to understand, you know, are you focused on developing a product or are you just looking for, uh, you know, research expertise in particular narrow area? Are you looking for market access or tech development? Are you looking for knowledge or training? Um, are you looking for investors? 
um, you know, what are you looking for? What do you need to operate um, as, a, as a smart packaging company or packaging company having a smart packaging interest in, in the North American market? Um, I think that you should not have the expectation that just because you talk to a company that they will jump on an idea that you have and they will co-invest with you. I think you need to, you, you need to bring some um, valuable consideration to the table your own funding, and over time as your relationship deepens with the partner, um, then you can start uh, sort of thinking about co-investment. But at the, at the first outset, I think it's, um, it's customary that you, know, you, you start a partnership. You start a partnership based on technology that they may have or they may have access to a market, but you need to be able to fund that opportunity. Um, so our interest is, is, is really to give you the way you can be successful because very many uh, organizations that come to us, they say we want a partner and want other people to invest in our ideas. And that's great, but it will be harder for you. So our interest is to really show you that if you bring funding for a project, I think it will get done and the partnership will evolve over time. And you also need to know what value you bring to the table beyond funding. So if you have technology, you have end users, you have pilot project opportunities, you have purchasing power, these are all highly valued by Canadian companies. And so there's, you just need to be clear as to what you bring to the table. And of course, it will take some time, but don't, you know, don't take too much time. We are business-like people. We like to move forward and, um, you know, we don't like to, you know, drag our feet. If, if there is a good opportunity, I think we, we march in an orderly fashion and we like to move things forward. So with that, um, I finished my presentation. I, I was right in the you know, uh, less than 30 minute mark. So if there are any questions, I will be more than happy to answer questions. And Andre Dion also is online if there is a question for um, the EdPAC uh, cluster representative and ICI with Andre Dion. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Um, thank you so much, Peter, um, for this very interesting presentation and give us the opportunity to know more about the packaging market in Canada and also to know more about the business culture in Canada. And as I said at the beginning, if you have any question, please just raise your hand so we will give you the microphone or just write your question in the chat, so um, we will wait for your questions. Okay, seems like there are no questions at the moment. Um, of course, uh, we, we have all the contact details, so if you think about this and if you have questions later on, just send them to us and we will forward them to Peter. And I would really like to thank Peter and Andre as well um, for, for this presentation. And I would like to go further to Mark, um, and he is from SPI. USA, so he's our ambassador in the US market. It's <laughs> it's quite difficult now uh, to speak um, uh, to speak um, after the presentation from Canada um, because there's a you, you have to fight now for your market. I, I think uh, Mark, but uh, I'm pretty sure you you will do this very well. And uh, yeah, Mark, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I assume I'm speaking with Katharina. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Hello, can you? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, okay, correct. yes. Well, nice, nice to meet you, and thank you very much. Um, I did uh, listen to uh, Peter and his presentation. Quite interesting, uh, and in fact, I would agree with Peter on all of his remarks in general. Um, I'd like to start first. <clears throat> first off, I apologize. I am. Uh, I have a pretty bad cold uh, today, so I might cough in the middle of this, so I apologize for that in advance. 
A um, little background on myself. I am with SPI USA. I have been with SPI and lived in Europe for four years, uh, starting in 2000. So I've been with the SPI group for about 20 years. I've been representing companies from Europe and the U.S. market for 20 years. Uh, and I do uh, research and business strategic planning with small and medium enterprises. Uh, before my work with SPI, I was a, a project manager and a strategic manager for a large multi-billion dollar company in the U.S., uh, Procter & Gamble's uh, major competitor here in the U.S., and I worked with national suppliers and international suppliers who supported uh, eight uh, manufacturing plants that I was responsible uh, uh, to, uh, with regard to production. Uh, and I also did uh, market entry um, pr product development work with that company as well. So I have a background in the U.S. and def background in Europe and years of experience of representing European companies in the U.S. market. So with that, I'd like to, uh, my approach here will be from a more general perspective. Uh, hopefully I will touch on items that will give an understanding or give some, some perspective, new perspective to those of you on this call. Um, I'd like to first start with, uh, hold on a second, I'm not, there we go, let me see if that works. I'm not able to uh, change slides. Did you give me control on that? Oh, there we go. Okay. So I'd first like to start off, I heard some of this, I think Lubos gave a presentation on ADPAC and so it's, it's clusters and a very important point I'd like to make is that smart packaging includes a wide range and variety of companies and research organizations. And because of that, each of them may have a different approach to the U.S. market. So uh, in our view, when we work with companies uh, who are coming to the U.S. market, we're very much looking at the profile of, the, of who they're trying to collaborate with. If it's a research entity, who they're trying to collaborate on research or on market entry. If they're a company looking to expand to the U.S. market, and so it's very important for us to have a clear understanding of their objectives, and that will drive a very specific approach to the U.S. So uh, this is an important point to make because there are very different approaches to the U.S. that you can take as it is a large market, as we will get into in a minute. And so it's important to have very specific objectives and a very specific target partner or, par or target market profile. And I still am having trouble transferring slides. There it goes. Okay, I guess there's a delay. Um, <clears throat> a couple general points I'd like to make about the U.S. market. Uh, most of us know this. The U.S. is quite large. It's two and a half times the size of Western Europe. A 325 million population and largest GDP of 18.5 trillion. The point that I'd like to make here also is that we have a purchasing power that's quite high. And so that's an, it's an excellent market. It's attractive to companies, of course. And right at the moment, you're seeing figures here on official unemployment and underemployment rates that from back in September 2017 and April 2017. These have significantly gotten better, although these were low at the time as well. And we're at unemployment, I believe, last one I saw was at 3.7 or so. The underemployment rate is a more important figure, in my view. Underemployment are those that are that um, are, have taken, it accounts for those that are looking for employment and are unemployed, as well as those that have taken jobs that are not at their capability level or have taken part-time jobs. That's a better sign of how well the economy is going at the moment. And the underemployment rate was 14%. It's lower now. I think it's around 10% at the moment. And so this is, this is very significant, and it shows how strong the U.S. economy is um, today. <clears throat> As we look at population concentrations, since the U.S. is a large geographical market, it is important for us to understand where the populations are, are located. And that's similar to Canada. Um, Canada has its populations on the east and along the border with the U.S. primarily. In the U.S., we have our population concentrations along the east, eastern area, uh, coastline. And let me see if I can use a, no, I don't see it on here today, a tool. Oh, there it is. Okay, I can use a pointer. Okay, there we go. 
And so on the eastern coastline, we have large concentrations of populations, especially in the northeast. Many European countries, uh, Portugal, Spain, and so forth, have uh, relationships in the northeast here uh, due to its proximity to Europe. It's a good entry point to the U.S. market. But we also have high concentrations of population along the west coast, as you see in California. We'll talk about California quite a bit. Um, and so it's important to have an understanding of where your target markets are. Uh, when, when we work with uh, small and medium enterprises on product side, we will focus primarily on any one of these dark spots here is a high concentration of population. If you see here a pointer on Los Angeles, it's a high concentration uh, of population there. And so that could be an easily a target market for a small or medium enterprise and looking for a distributor or a partner in the market. And we do the same in the Northeast as well. And we, and we have actually been very successful in Texas and Dallas and Houston with with it, within the food sector. And so it's important, my point here is that it, to have a, it's important to have a clear understanding of where the population concentrations are and, and, and identify a priority region if you're entering the market from a product standpoint. If you're entering the market from a high technology perspective, then of course uh, this doesn't take into account. Then we look at a different profile and we identify who your potential partner should be based on a profile that we've developed with you. And that partner could be located anywhere in the country, uh, normally in a cluster of, of research organizations or, or a specialty area. Moving on, looking at the domestic product by state. I like this slide because it gives you a good perspective of the size from a GDP perspective, uh, standpoint in the US. This was in 2015. And what you see here is France in 2015 was equal to the GDP of California. Now in 2017, I think it was 2017 in September, uh, California surpassed the UK as the fifth largest economy in the world. So taking that into account, California is now, I would replace France with the UK. And so it gives you some perspective of just looking at California, you're looking at a, quite a large market. And so you see the geographical area that would be covered by Germany or Italy. Uh, from a GDP pers perspective. And so most companies look at this and they see the U.S. as being very challenging. And that's where we play a role in helping them to break down the market and really focus on specific regions or a specific profile of the organization that they want, want to collaborate with. Foreign direct investment is a very good indicator of, of how well the sector is doing in the U.S. and I like this slide because it gives you some perspective of how FDI has increased over the years and if I use a slider or uh, the pointer I mean uh, you'll see that the manufacturing has increased relatively same uh, increase as the overall curve of the total FDI in the U.S. economy. And so you're seeing the increase of FDI being driven by manufacturing. And that's an important point to make. Still a lot of innovation occurring in the U.S., still a lot of manufacturing. This is about 7% of the GDP. And so I work with, with a lot of production technology companies and, and those in the high-tech area and production technology with very unique technologies, they definitely find a place in the U.S. and, and a need for their technologies. So it's important to, to understand that. <clears throat> now going into challenges and opportunities. Of course, uh, we can look at the main challenges that are easily identifiable, which is um, <clears throat> the size of the market, which we spoke to a little bit earlier. Uh, normally need to identify target region markets, as I mentioned. A geographical distance from the market. Of course, in Europe, you're, you're, you're over the, the pond, as we say, and so it is uh, there is a geographical distance to the East Coast and even larger to the West Coast. I'm based in Los Angeles, so I, I deal with that issue all the time. And the time zone difference, uh, five to 10 hours difference depending on the region. But quite honestly, I find the time zone difference to be a benefit for the work that I do. I work with high tech companies and in often cases when we have an issue with a, a client in the US, uh, I find out about it in the afternoon here on the West Coast and it gives me, if they're a West Coast client, it gives me uh, overnight to work the issue with, with my uh, company in Europe and to come back with a solution or an adequate response to the client by the, their next morning. 
And so we find that uh, our high-tech clients here in the, or customers in the U.S. are very happy with the service that we're able to provide uh, through, through uh, leveraging the time zone difference. Of course, you have a diff you have an issue there if you become aware of a problem in the morning you're on the West Coast, then it gives you a very short period of time to deal with a European uh, <coughs> main, main office in Europe to troubleshoot that problem before uh, their day is over. But in most cases, we find this works to our, we're able to leverage the time zone difference. Exchange rate fluctuations, of course, that's always an issue. And then local laws and regulations, we do have uh, a complex system here in the U.S. where we do have uh, state and local laws as well as federal laws to deal with. Um, and the most complex are in California. So if you're able to deal with them in California, you're most likely you're able to deal with them anywhere in the U.S. Uh, strong competition. In many cases, we have saturated markets. Uh, but if you have a unique technology, uh, that isn't an issue, of course, right? You're bringing something new, some innovation to the U.S. market, which is the leading innovation market in the world, and so in many sectors still. Um, and I should have included one of those slides, but I didn't. But it, um, it, we are very strong in many sectors. And so if you're bringing a, a technology into the U.S., we absorb that technology well. And, and uh, of course, if it, uh, you, you are able to compete extremely well in the market if you have a niche technology. Uh, litigation is common. Uh, I believe we had less numbers I saw. We had one lawyer per 300 inhabitants, and that's compared to, I think it was the UK and Spain that had one lawyer to every 400. So yes, we have, uh, we, uh, litigation is a common issue here, and so that's always a concern. Let's see if I'm able to change the slide. There we go. Okay, uh, potential challenges <clears throat> to move on, uh, product or service dependence. So in the previous slide, we saw those that were general. And here we're looking at those that are more specific and are dependent on a product or a service. And it's achieving, and the first one there is achieving a competitive price point. Uh, this speaks to a lot to cooperation agreements with the U.S. in this area. Um, it's very easy for us to determine what the price point should be to be competitive. And many companies, retailers, distributors, and so forth, won't speak with you unless you're within a threshold of a price point. So it, um, very easy to have, a uh, very small effort is needed to see if you're competitive and uh, see if you'd have any uh, traction in the U.S. purely based on price point. Uh, and so that's important to understand. Also, uh, price point is, the first, is one of the first things that are discussed uh, before establishing a meeting in the U.S. as well. So Americans are very pr um, practical. Um, I would compare this. I did a lot of work in China. I think you had a presentation from a, uh, a Chinese colleague of mine as well. Um, in China, it's easy to get to establish a meeting um, because they like to meet with uh, with foreigners and to look at opportunities. In the U.S., uh, most companies, and I'm speaking from generalities, but my experience has been that most companies are very practical, and they definitely want to see what their opportunity is up front. And if, if, you, if, you're, if they're a distributor or retailer, they definitely want to see pricing before they'll even meet with you. And so uh, that's critical. And if you're a technology provider, they, they will do their research on uh, your technology and see if it's something that is of interest to them before they will schedule a meeting with you. So it's important to ha uh, put forth that effort. Um, it takes a, several interactions before you, normally before you can sit down and have a productive meeting with a, uh, with a U.S. company. Um, on the research within the research community, that's quite different. If you're look, looking at research institutes or research universities, well, then you know, they're they're open to meet with you and to spend the time to develop that collaborate some collaborative effort and look at what opportunities exist. Um, so much less on the on the um, on the practical side um, and much more on building that relationship to see what comes out of that relationship. Um, so uh, that's just from experience and very generalizations. Uh, but uh, it's, it's what we found that happens in the U.S. market. Moving on, effective market presence. Oh, somehow I, there we go. Oh, someone else is controlling this for me. Great. So effective market presence, uh, cost associated with required market representation. So it's also important to look at your competition here and see how they're present in the market. We do a lot of that. And with that drives how you need to be present in the market and the type of financial risk you take to enter the U.S. market. 
Um, and so we could talk about that, but that would be a whole nother presentation. Uh, state requirements, I, I spoke to this a little bit about California. Non-tariff barriers vary by state, labeling and so forth, and the, the most stringent is in California. So if you meet that, you pretty much meet the, what's required nationwide. Product liability law, and as well as a complex tax system. So those are, those are some of the negative sides. So let's move on to the next slide and look, and look more at the opportunities. And so the main opportunities, the large, mark, uh, large single market is, is a challenge, but it's also a benefit. And so uh, it's important to understand it and how to leverage the market. Uh, one common language, uh, we speak English, it's a common language across the U.S., although Spanish is becoming more and more important in the, in the uh, southwest states. Um, but still, English is the business language, and, and of course, we have a common culture as well. It, it varies slightly across the country because of our geographical presence, but it's a common culture, and, and once you understand the culture, it's very easy to work within that culture. Economically and politically stable, um, although that is being challenged at the moment, as, as you probably well know, we have, uh, I think we're in our 31st day of uh, federal shutdown, but nevertheless, I, I am able to get on a plane later today to Europe, so our, our uh, federal employees that are, are are necessary or at work. Unfortunately, they're not uh, receiving pay at the moment. Um, but uh, we are a very stable economy and stable politically um, in general. Um, and of course, we will continue to be. So it's a very, uh, from that perspective, it's a risk-free environment for investments. A access to global supply chains, of course, that goes without saying. We are a shipper around the world. If you have a product in the U.S., you have uh, logistics supply chains uh, access any any market in the world. Uh, low average tariffs, which is true, uh, under 3% between the EU and the U.S., so that's very much a strong benefit. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and potential opportunities from a product service dependency side or <coughs> perspective. Uh, technologically advanced economy, I spoke to that a little bit earlier. Uh, we are the most innovative economy in the world. We are still ranked number one or number two in many uh, significant sectors, aeronautical, um, across manufacturing sectors, although I have to admit that um, uh, something that I was not aware of that I became aware of uh, earlier this year in, in facilitating a workshop or last year is that on robotics side, actually, uh, China has leaped over us on manufacturing and robotics, and so now we're learning from the Chinese on research in that area. But in general, our research is very strong, uh, as, you, as you probably know, and we have um, from that and from our venture capital investments, we have very strong innovations in the U.S. and innovation clusters such, such as Silicon Valley, which everyone's aware of. Um, and so that combination drives many innovations in the market. And using Silicon Valley as an example, uh, last figure I saw up to 60 or 70 percent of the startups in Silicon Valley uh, going after venture capital funding are from abroad. So we are still attracting those startups, that most innovative startups, into the U.S. seeking funding and become established in the U.S. So that's a very strong uh, characteristics of the, of the United States market from a technology innovation perspective. There are certainly niche market opportunities. Um, Value-added products do a lot of work in this area, especially in country of origin, uh, as, we, as you see from Italy, Spain, Portugal, Germany, um, all France. So there's obviously added value from the country of origin, and there's niche markets here. Um, and so finding a niche market within one region of the U.S. can be a very, very large market for a European supplier. Uh, comprehensive intellect, intel, <coughs> excuse me, intellectual property. IP laws. This one is a, is a tricky one because, yes, we do have strong IP laws, just like Europe, um, but it also takes uh, financial capability to protect your IP. And so you have two sides to that coin. And so that's important to understand that. Um, product certification. Certain products can be tested and certified outside the U.S. by private industry organizations, uh, which is true, so that's always a strong benefit. And so we find that it's quite easy for companies that we work with to meet the requirements of the U.S., to enter the U.S. market, um, and to do it in a risk-free risk environment. Um, so with that, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. 
And so let's just a couple numbers on packaging industry numbers. Uh, overall, uh, expected to grow 510 billion units 2016 to five, 549 billion units in 2021, so quite large market, a compound annual growth rate of 1.4%. And I'd like to just highlight here that the, the rigid plastic is expected to be one of the largest contributors to this at 2.5% growth through 2000. 2021. Soft drink and dairy food sectors are what's driving that. And it's interesting, we're seeing wine introduced in the PET bottle a lot in the U.S. So it's, it's interesting the moves that are being made in the rigid plastics area. From a rigid metals perspective, it's, it's declining. Um, and it's declining because of a fall in beer consumption, which I find hard to believe. I think that needs to take a little more research, but uh, that seems to be the case. And then paperboard, it, it, Paperboard's interesting. It's about 33.7% of the total market, with corrugated packaging claiming the largest share, of course. And, and that's believed to uh, to increase, but I don't have a number on that. Uh, flexi flexibles expected, expecting a 1.9% compound annual growth rate increase, and that's uh, consumer interest in small pack sizes and convenient closures. So uh, that's very common. We Americans like to like to have convenience. And so that is definitely growing. Uh, from a glass expected, expecting a 1.4% increase, and that's being driven by the <clears throat> by consumer interest in health, since glass is virtually inert. That's the main driver of that ish, of that segment. Excuse me. So can we move to the next slide? And just highlighting a couple here: corrugated industry, 33.1 billion dollars a year industry. Uh, of course, it's the most frequent used shipping material and then flexible packaging industry includes uh, pack packaging made of paper plastic and so forth as we we all understand that uh, it's generated 31 billion in sales in 2015 so quite large market in the US uh, retail ready packaging this is always uh, back in my previous life this was a huge um, interest and it still is with retailers so you know, convenience and 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 dealing with the uh, utilizing labor uh, and shelving product of course they'd rather have ready for on shelf product displays uh, without the need of unpacking it or un assembling and so this is always a, an interest with retailers and so it's one that I like to highlight uh, please next slide I'd like to provide you with a list of uh, packaging related associations and this is just a, a small list of what's out there and here you see the packaging association and the number of members and included here uh, if they have an event or not uh, and as you see here the packaging machinery manufacturers institute PMMI has a trade show and actually we we're at the pack expo uh, last uh, what was that? I believe it was October um, yeah, or it might have been November. <laughs> um, and so uh, they have a trade show that is coming up in September in Las Vegas, of course, and so that's a major show for the industry, and, and there you get a good perspective of what the level of packaging uh, technology is in the U.S. Uh, and what's coming into the U.S. Uh, Retail Packaging Association is also a large association here in the U.S., and they have convention trade show. Their, theirs is in February and I believe it's in Orlando uh, this this year, uh, so this coming month in Orlando. So two large associations and, and their events uh, should be on your radar if you're interested in making a trip to the U.S. to just get a, a feel for what the what the sector is like in the U.S. from a technology and, and packaging market perspective. And then I list uh, several others there that may be of interest with their website. So I don't know if this presentation will be available after the call, but uh, uh, this this list. If you email me, I'd be more than happy to, to send you information. Next slide. Now I'd like to just uh, <clears throat> follow up with a couple of emphasis here. First off, um, I like this slide because it it gives you a perspective of the top ten states from a number of, of manufacturing locations. And here you see California and uh, and Texas. <clears throat> you also see Illinois, Michigan. Wisconsin and, and New York, Pennsylvania, and uh, North Carolina here, as well as Florida. And what you'll see, I have a series of slides after this that will give you some perspective, and you'll see common 
um, trends here. Um, we normally find in technology and, and when it comes to manufacturing and definitely in, in smart packaging and so forth, you, you will find interest in different regions of the U.S. and those interests will primarily be in these states. Um, and so uh, if we go to the next slide, thank you, that's fine. Next slide, you see a pack, use packaging materials manufacturers, for example, and this is using the standard industri industry classification codes. Um, you may be familiar with the North American industry classification system as well. Uh, we switch between the two depending on how much we can dial in on the target profile that we're looking for. And so we find on the packaging materials manufacturing, the, the seek number works well here. And this is just an example of high concentration of, of manufacturers. And as you look at this, you see them definitely in the in California and in San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, and then you have high concentration here in the Northeast, as well as spots Atlanta and Dallas and Houston, and so across in different areas of the country. And so if we were looking to partner with a with a packaging material manufacturer, we'd focus on these regions, or better term would be metropolitan areas, uh, to identify potential partners to start with. And so that significantly decreases the market size or target market for, um, for you. And so this would be the first exercise we would do from a part, if you're looking at partnering with a packaging materials manufacturer. Uh, next slide, please. Plastic bottles manufacturers, you see similar trends here. You see California is quite large. The size of the bubble uh, shows the significance of the metropolitan area in this area with number of manufacturers. And then you see in Detroit and Michigan up here as well. Uh, you always, you're going to start to see presence in Seattle, Washington, and that's just because you have a large population in the northwest here that is density is very low. And so a very strong metropolitan area in Seattle, and that area is a service, that low-density region, and so you see a concentration there, uh, similar in Colorado and, and so forth, Texas. Um, so you're starting to see similar trends here as far as where the concentration of manufacturers are. Next slide, please. Looking at metal can manufacturers, <clears throat> same, same output here. Um, what's very interesting here, here is that this is specifically the food and beverage containers. And what's interesting here is that you do have a high concentration in Modesto in California, and that's because we have uh, vegetable production in the San Joaquin Valley, Salinas Valley area. And so I, I think that that area in total is responsible for 70%, 80% of the vegetable production countrywide. And so the canning there is quite high, um, and that's why you have, see a concentration there besides the concentration in the Bay Area. So two dots there if you, if you can see that. And then large concentration in Los Angeles, metropolitan area as well. And you see it on the East Coast as well as Chicago. And again in Dallas and Denver, Colorado. So um, pretty interesting uh, results on that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> if we look at the uh, glass bottles concentration, uh, we see an added concentration down in the southern part of California, which is due to San Diego. And uh, I apologize for that. Someone's calling me on Skype, and I'm doing this call over Skype. Um, so uh, we see a large concentration on, uh, sorry about that. We see a large concentration in San Diego area, and that's primarily due to uh, the pharma, I, I believe it's due to the pharmaceutical industry that's in that area. And so you see uh, in glass containers, you see San Diego, Los Angeles, and the Bay Area. And then you see the typical locations um, across the country with a few more in the middle of Ohio and southeast part of Ohio and down here in Memphis and Tennessee. And so, and again, in, in Washington due to the large geographical area that that supports. And so glass bottles, similar trends as we saw with the previous slides. So it's important from a market perspective, it's very easy to dial in on these areas. But as I said earlier, if you're looking at a technology partnership or research uh, partnership of any kind, then we're looking at uh, specific, unique research labs, institutes, or groups, research teams that we would want to identify. And that's something that we would do countrywide 
Um, and we, we start that normally by looking at, um, <clears throat> at research papers and doing a data mining of citations in the U.S. to identify those that are leading in the specific research area of interest. And we also work with the National Science Foundation a great deal in their centers. Um, and so their centers are very innovative um, and do uh, technology transfer, uh, very much focused on industry support, especially in the industry university collaborative uh, technology centers. And so we work with them uh, on a regular basis uh, when we see a direct uh, relationship to a possible client that we may have from Europe. And so uh, it's a good node to start with our, our, our launching point in the U.S. to then network and develop greater and stronger collaborations in the research field. So with that, um, uh, I think you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, a couple of closing comments I'd like to make. On um, the cooperation agreement perspective, uh, I would agree with, uh, with the speaker from Canada and the approach. Uh, from what I find is that uh, the role of each uh, cooper uh, cooperation agreements work well within research and technology development, of course, in those two areas. Um, it's clear that you have to have a, have a clearly defined role of that and an added value that you bring to the collaboration that, that you're presenting or proposing to a U.S. entity. And it's also important that you bring your own funding. Um, what we, we found is in the U.S., um, you definitely need to, need, need to come with your own funding. Um, as the U.S. does with European projects, we do a lot of work with Horizon 2020 in collaborations between the U.S. and European part, uh, organizations in Horizon 2020. And I've worked all the way back to Framework Program 4. Um, so it's in the U.S. normally has to come with their own funding. Well, it's the same case if you're conducting research and you want to collaborate with the U.S. from Europe. You really have to come with your own funding. Uh, there's very few research programs in the U.S. that will fund uh, foreign entities on research projects. And they're normally very strategic programs. Um, and, and most of those are within the Department of Defense uh, umbrella area. So um, that's, that's critical. Um, but uh, never the case. Uh, if you have a, a specific role that you you can, uh, you would play in a role of the organization that you're pursuing in the U.S. Um, and it's strong and there's a clear objective, um, the U.S. companies, research entities are always interested in developing those collaborations. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you may have. Um, yeah, first of Hope all, thank you, thank you very much, Mark, uh, for your very interesting presentation. And yeah, as I said before, if you have any question, it doesn't have to be related to packaging, of course. Um, so if you just have business questions or cultural questions, um, I guess it's not that difficult then to China, which we had this morning. Uh, but if you have any questions, just raise your hand or write it in the chat. Also, my email is there on the screen, so feel free to email me with any questions or to follow up. I'm more than happy to answer simple uh, questions for you or give you simple guidance. Okay, perfect. Seems like I know it's, oh. it's <laughs> Friday afternoon. Everyone's thinking about the weekend. Okay. <laughs> yeah, seems like. Um, I'm not quite sure Lubos is writing something. Even he can speak, actually. Uh, okay, he says thank you. Um, so, yes, I, I would like to say thank you to uh, Mark and Peter. Um, thank you really so much uh, for these very interesting and very good um, presentations. And we are really happy um, that we could have you here. And uh, for all the others, as I said already, please contact us if you have any questions from the speakers, so we will provide you with, with the necessary information. And I wish to Mark, Peter, and Andre, I wish you a nice uh, working day and, of course, a nice weekend as well. And for all the European colleagues, I wish you a nice weekend. Thank you.